Good afternoon. Welcome to the panel, Migration from Refugees to Citizens. Good morning to those of you who are in Berlin and in Europe. Uh, good afternoon to those of you who are in Berlin and Europe. Good morning to those of you who are on the other side of the pond in the United States. My name is David Sorkin. I teach modern Jewish history at Yale University, and it's my pleasure to, to uh, chair this session of three very challenging and exciting papers. Our format this morning uh, will be the presentation of the three papers in the order in which they're listed on the program, and we'll then have time for questions and answers. Please send your questions via chat uh, to um, the organizers. Our first speaker uh, is uh, Professor Tobias Brinkman from Penn State University, uh, where he is the Malvin and Leah Bank Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History and Director of the Jewish Studies Program. Uh, he is the author of a book called Sundays at Sinai, uh, about a classical reform Jewish temple in Chicago, founded by uh, German Jewish emigres, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2012. Um, I have to say that that's the temple in which I grew up, uh, and I found Tobias's book uh, absolutely fascinating. He's also the editor of two um, uh, uh, two collections of essays, one on points of passage, Jewish transmigrations from Eastern Europe to Scandinavia, Germany and Britain, 1880 to 1914, and Migration and Transnationalität, Perspektiven Deutsch-Jüdischer Geschichte from 2013. So please welcome uh, Tobias Brinkmann, who will be speaking on the subject uh, fathers and sons writing the history of the Morgenthau family. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, Vera is going first. We had, uh, uh, so her presentation is up. That's why I think it's probably easier. Uh, sorry. Oh, about, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Our first presentation then is by Vera Kallenberg who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of North American History at the University of Erfurt. Uh, she's the author of a book called Judinen und Juden und der Frankfurter Strafgerichtbarkeit 1780 bis 1814 uh, in English, Jews before the Frankfurt Criminal Court, 1700, 1780 to 1814, Non-Unity in Jewish History, published by, Walsti by Wallstein, uh, and the winner of the Arno Lustiger Prize for an Outstanding Dissertation in Frankfurt Jewish History. Uh, Dr. Kallenberg. Hello. I am pleased uh, to have the uh, opportunity to give you a glimpse of my research on Jews before the Frankfurt Penal Court, 1780 to 1814. Let me first provide you with some background information about my research and the historical situation of Jews in Frankfurt around 1800. First point. My study demonstrates how the Christian authoritarian criminal jurisdiction treated Jews before court at the turn of the 19th century and makes Jewish agency within the criminal justice system visible. My analysis of court records concerning Jews fulfills a double objective. I can not only show the impact of Jewishness on the practice of criminal justice, but also reconstruct Jewish gender, cultural and everyday history around 1800 based on these sources. Second, at this time, the number of protected Jews was limited and strictly regulated and the enormous restrictions with regard to the right of settlement, residence and the establishment of a household also limited the ways to make a living. However, 
unlike the impression given by older literature, a variety of these normative restrictions were not fully implemented in practice. For example, in contrast to the authorities' intentions, Jewish and non-Jewish spheres of life in Frankfurt were hardly separated. Daily life consisted of regular encounters of the two, as well as a considerable <laughs> interpenetration of their respective spaces. As a result, Jews were constantly present in the city. Also contrary to the prohibition, Jews went to the city hall just as other subjects did to submit petitions or negotiate legal disputes with Christians or Jews. As in other territories, the adjudication and decisions of courts in Frankfurt intersected with various imperial, municipal, administrative, penal and civil laws. The partial legal autonomy of the Jewish community, which had made this situation even more complicated, was further reduced when Frankfurt became part of the principality of Prince Primate Karl Theodor von Dahlberg after 806. After this very short introduction, I would like to present you a case from 809, which can be divided into two phases. The first phase uh, is one of inner Jewish conflict regulation, while the second begins when the case is transferred to Christian authorities. The case started when, end of May, Samuel, son of Schutzu de Vallo, went to the Jewish police inspection to accuse 30-year-old Sarah, the maid of Schutzu de Brüsselsheimer, of abortion in two cases. The women concerned, Schöne and Lisbeth, were made serving two different Schutzjuden. Jewish police inspectors Zichi and Royce acted immediately, summoned the maids as witnesses and Sarah as the accused, interrogated them and arrested Sarah. Shirley and his first denied having been pregnant and declared they had only asked Sarah for medicine in cases of cessation of menstruation. Sarah's testimony concurred with those of the maids in everything except for her claim that she never took any money for her help. In the process of interrogation, Shirley and Lisbeth confessed their pregnancies and Sarah had to admit to having been paid for the medicine, which, however, had consisted of harmless herbs that could never have caught the chief. As a result, the Jewish police investigated on suspicion of swindle by way of false medicine and harlotry. The second phase begins when the Jewish police inspection transferred the case to the municipal interrogation of the Christian authority for both prosecution and sentencing in minor cases. The questioning of the accused and witnesses, including the Jewish police inspectors, started again. However, all maids kept denying ever having made the statements from the Jewish police's interrogation records. Even Samuel, whose report had prompted the investigation, now denied having said anything about pregnancy on at least one of the maids shown as part. This is why Jewish police inspectors Royce and Sichel produced another witness. The pregnant 16-year-old Christian maid Dorothea, who served a Jewish family. She claimed to have bought medicine from Sarah after getting pregnant from having been raped by another Schutzjude. In doing so, Dorothea used anti-Jewish labels that linked the label of the money Jew with the one of the male Jew as a seducer and defiler of Christian women. Based on Dorothea's account, the court ruled that no sexual assault had taken place and did not demand any investigation into this matter. Neither of the maids could prove having paid Sarah for the medicine and the Jewish police inspections records were considered substandard. The proceedings were closed and Sarah was set free after her custody pending trial was taken into account as punishment. What does this case tell us about the shared history of Jews and Gentiles in Frankfurt around 1800? First point. The case demonstrates daily encounters between Jewish and non-Jewish maids in female affairs, as well as their shared female experience. In addition, the maids' behavior and the reactions of the Christian authorities were similar in comparable cases involving exclusively Christian actors. Second point, 
the Jewish maids example reveals the problems generally linked to illegitimate pregnancies around 1800 as if under a magnifying glass. It is true that not every Christian maid could afford to marry or receive official permission to do so. However, the analysis of the Jewish maids deviance has to consider the especially precarious situation of Jewish maids who had the legal status as foreigners. Most maids who served in Jewish households in Frankfurt at the time were Jewish migrants. As such, they had no right of settlement of their own, but only a right of residence tied to their employer. This is very important because marriage permits for Jews were tied to the right of settlement. Given the fact that these enormous restrictions increased during the Dahlberg era, Jewish maids with migrant status had no chance of starting a household in Frankfurt. Third point. The case provides insight into the interaction of Christians and Jews in conflict regulation. Its criminal uh, dimension prompted the case to leave the inner Jewish sphere. The case shows both old and new elements. The proceedings in Sarah's case are comparable to the inquisitory proceedings in similar cases during the Ancien Régime. And so did the line of defense, which the maids used accordingly. What's new about it is that Sarah wasn't banned from Frankfurt after custody, a form of spatial exclusion typical for this type of offense in the Ancien Regime, especially concerning Jews. The question is, why was Sarah not convicted? The Apartments for Hörerand couldn't produce any evidence against Sarah. It could have sentenced her based on the Jewish police records, but that would have meant acknowledging these as fully valid legal documents, implying legal equality of the Jewish police and the Christian court. The contradictory statements of all Jewish witnesses could also be explained by their hope that statements made to the Jewish police remain without legal consequences. Another question is, why Initial complainer Samuel retracted the statement later. I take this and the other inconsistent written statements as that Sarah is controversial within the Jewish community. On the one hand, all uh, of Sarah's former employer, employers wrote impeccable testimonials about her during the course of the proceedings. On the other hand, the Jewish police inspector, inspectors seem overly eager to convict her and went as far as to produce a Christian witness who accused her of rape. Overall, the Jewishness of the accused received just as little attention from the court during interrogation as it did as a resource from the Jewish actors or in the statements of the Christian actors. The Jewish component of the case manifested itself in the particularly strict marriage regulations of the Dahlbeck period and acted in this drastic manner exclusively for Jews. The case shows how these restrictions impacted especially made servants with migrant status. In summary, the case was shaped by the interplay of the legal and institutional framework, which included a Jewish police unit as a new such actor and the precarious social position of the accused constituted at the intersection of gender, marital status, migrant status, socioeconomic status and Jewishness. Thank you for the attention. <coughs> uh, thank you, Vera, for your paper. Uh, we'll now proceed to uh, Tobias Brinkman's paper. Uh, as I said before, he's the Melvin and Leah Bank Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History and Director of the Jewish Studies Program at Penn State University. Tobias. Thank you, David, for the introduction. I think I first I'll try to share my presentation here. Uh, let's see. Ah, I see. One moment. Uh, I'll just remind the audience that the title of uh, Tobias Brinkman's paper is Fathers and Sons writing the history of the Morgenthau family. Yeah, so I'm running here in problems with the sharing. That's not a problem. I just do it without the presentation. Not a problem. So I uh, am talking about the Morgenthau family 
uh, I want to uh, briefly discuss um, two sort of very general observations about the family as such and um, the sort of meta level aspects that are connected to the history of the Morgenthau family before I actually will briefly talk about the actual story and also how I came to it. The first aspect that I want to highlight is uh, that uh, the Morgenthau story, the family, it's a German American Jewish family history. That is not unusual. There's, uh, it's actually an interesting feature of German American Jewish history. Uh, are these uh, prominent families uh, uh, whose members over generations played influential roles in, in different spheres, uh, business, politics, arts, uh, you know, the Rothschilds come to mind or the Warburgs. Uh, and the Morgenthau uh, family is one of these families. Um, and if you look at the history of the family, uh, it is a story of success and failure, uh, of embarrassment. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, what really struck me uh, are very complicated uh, father-son relationships in this family, uh, where fathers and sons have very complicated and, and even broken relationships. Um, and what is also interesting is the question of family memory or Familiengedächtnis in German, uh, which has been studied. Uh, and also oblivion, in a sense, I mentioned the embarrassment part. So that's the family part. Interesting is that there's uh, what struck me. There's uh, there are quite a few publications about the Morgenthaus, but they come from within the family. Uh, so there's really not a critical study yet uh, that covers the history of the family, you know, comparable to the Warburgs or, the, you know, the Rothschilds. Uh, what is more interesting for me as a historian uh, is really the meta level. I think the history of the Morgenthau family sheds a very interesting light on the history of uh, 20th century global history, uh, 20th century global history uh, in, in different ways. Uh, I think it raises, this is another related point, the question of repairing the world, right? So Henry Morgenthau Sr., who was the ambassador of the United States in the Ottoman Empire, and his son, Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Treasury Secretary during the FDR administration, really tried to fix uh, major problems, right? The Armenian genocide and, and the German problem. Um, and so I think this issue of repairing the world, tikkun, I think is a big issue here. The uh, Another point that I think is very interesting about the history of not just the Morgenthau, but the other families I mentioned, are these clashing visions of Germany. There's a vision of Germany that's inclusive, related to Bildung, to uh, the Enlightenment, and then uh, there is another dark vision of Germany. Uh, you know, the Morgenthau plan is hovering in the background here. So Germany as a nation of barbarians uh, and, and destruction. So uh, really a clashing vision. Uh, and another theme that is also important for the Morgenthau family is, uh, and I'm using here Peter Gay's term, outsiders as insiders or insiders as outsiders. Uh, especially Henry Morgenthau Sr. and Henry Morgenthau Jr. were prominent public servants, but they also moved in a in a in a in a, in a social space uh, where they encountered anti-Semitism on a on a daily level. Uh, so they were moving on very thin ice, um, and uh, so this outsider insider theme is important, and that is also important, of course, for the 19th century history, uh, even more so. Uh, this story I just want to mention uh, does not fit to the panel theme. Uh, this is not a story of refugees to citizens. Um, so very quickly here, how did I come to this topic? Um, in 2018, Robert Morgenthau uh, donated his great grandfather's diary to the LBI. Uh, and uh, uh, a year ago, I was asked to trans to re basically write a short essay for the shared history uh, program. And um, the, uh, I was really struck by this text. Uh, so Lazarus, Lazarus Morgenthau is the father of Henry Sr. And the text was written in 1842, it's handwritten. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting to read, it's not very long. He grew up in utter destitution on the social margins. Um, uh, his father, they were constantly on the move um, and he lost his parents at a very young age. Uh, he had several siblings. Uh, and it is a story, uh, so he writes it in 1842, just as he has sort of uh, emancipated himself. He's, uh, he has an income, he was a peddler for a while, 
And it's a really success story of social mobility, social mobility, embourgeoisement, uh, verbürgerlichung. And he gained social status. He became a highly respected citizen of Mannheim. And uh, um, he was emancipated. Uh, so was Henry Senior, who was born in 1856. Um, Baden was the first state to emancipate its Jewish population. So they were citizens before they left uh, uh, the German states. Um, he wrote the memoir in German, not in Judendeutsch or Yiddish. Um, and he never went to school. This is interesting, uh, I think. Um, uh, he decided to move to America at a ripe age in his 40s. Uh, and this is the, the, the forgotten part. Uh, he failed. Uh, he uh, ended up in a lunatic asylum for a while. Uh, he distanced himself from his family. Uh, and it's, a, it's really a shocking, embarrassing story that was sort of uh, cut from the family memory until 1933 when the, within the family the text was transcribed and uh, this is uh, the text that was uh, donated to the, to the Leo Beck Institute in 2018. Um, so I think in the story of the family, uh, the most important figure is uh, Lazarus' son, Henry, who had basically no relationship to his father. He refused to talk to him. He was 10 years old when they moved to America. He had to basically make his own career. He's completely self-made, became a wealthy real estate investor uh, and a friend of uh, Woodrow Wilson, which explains this ambassadorship. Um, what is important are two issues here. He is a crucial figure in protecting the Yeshuv, so the Jews living in Palestine in 1914-15, even though he was an opponent of Zionism. And of course, he his claim to fame is the, uh, his publicizing the Armenian Genocide in 1915. Um, and uh, I came across this quite a few very interesting texts about him. Uh, and strangely enough, there's no biography of this man. Uh, in uh, 1941 in April, uh, he gave a longer sort of interview to the New York Times, and he described Germany uh, as a country that no longer exists, uh, a land of fine talk, music, and kindliness. So Germany was gone, it was destroyed, and he's basically calling on the United States. This is uh, you know, almost a year before the United States enters the war. Um, uh, to to destroy Germany, to stop Germany, and to to contain it, and it already contains, in a nutshell, the vision of the Morgenthau Plan. That, of course, he did not write, uh, but his son Henry Morgenthau Jr. Uh, and the Morgenthau Plan is, I think, I have a picture here of an Anselm Kiefer painting that I cannot show to you, which is fairly recent. Um, the Morgenthau Plan remains a major uh, site of memory or lieu de mémoire in uh, German memory to this day. I don't think that many Americans really know about this plan, uh, but in Germany it still resonates. Uh, and Anselm Kiefer, who has obviously engaged uh, critically with some of the major problematic German uh, uh, lieu de mémoire, uh, has sort of painted a couple or created a couple, a couple of images of the Morgenthau plan, which show uh, basically flowers, uh, very similar to, to Van Gogh paintings. But in a sense, it's a vision of a Germany uh, that would deprive Germany of in the, its industrial sector and turn it into an agricultural backward country that would not threaten the world anymore, uh, sort of, you know, comparable to Moldova or Romania in a sense uh, in that time period. And so it's really quite a stretch and um, I look forward to the discussion. I could only sort of give a short uh, tour de force uh, here, but I think the central part of my presentation is really the the meta level uh, that is connected to the history of this family, that it really raises interesting questions about 20th century global history uh, that are really important. And I find in particular important the issue of repairing the world. So I see uh, Henry Morgenthau Sr. and to a lesser extent, Henry Morgenthau Jr. Uh, as, as major figures in, in that history. And it's sort of interesting that it all starts with this peddler who uh, you know, uh, was successful and then failed uh, so that's a not so typical and yet very typical story uh, of German Jewish history in the 19th century. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for a fascinating paper. Our third paper is by um, uh, J.J. Kimchi, who is a doctoral candidate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. The title of his paper is migration as a national desideratum, the 
peregrinatory strain within German Jewish thought. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organizers of the conference and thank you to Professor Sorkin for uh, for chairing this chairing this panel. The topic I wish to broach to today concerns a strain of thought of intellectual history that has made its appearance within Jewish intellectual history over the past two centuries. Exceptionalism and nationalism are natural bedfellows. Nationalists from across the globe frequently base their territorial claims upon the uniqueness of their native cultural, linguistic or racial character and have advocated for a nation state precisely to preserve this imagined heritage. No less, many early Zionist thinkers propounded the belief that the Jewish people constituted a distinct, unique nation who were endowed by God or history or fate with some kind of exceptional status. This belief underwrote their claim to the land of Israel. By contrast, many anti-Zionists sought to minimize compartmentalize or explain away such notions of distinct Jewish exceptionalism in an effort to reject the necessity of a nation state. The intellectual strain I wish to bring to your attention today is a category that I have termed exceptionalist anti-Zionism. Thinkers of this school firmly rejected the resurrection of the Jewish nation state, advocating instead the virtues of an exilic migratory transcultural existence for Jewish communities around the world and specifically in their native Germany. I will briefly present the thoughts of three exemplars of this ideological category, all of whom significantly were prominent German Jewish thinkers. Uniquely, these thinkers based their anti-nationalism upon the conviction that the Jews are indeed an exceptional nation, either religiously, ontologically, or ethically superior to other peoples. Yet it is precisely this exceptionalism that, in their minds, obviates the need for a nation state. The first exemplar of this approach was Samson Raphael Hirsch, 1808 to 1888, an unusually literate and acculturated Orthodox rabbi, a central figure in the emergence of neo-Orthodox Judaism. His first significant work, 19 Briefe über Judentum, 1836, took literally the historical and theological narratives of the Bible and understood the Jews as having been selected and imbued with a specific divine mission to guide the rest of humanity towards the light of divinity, which Hirsch equated with the universal qualities of justice, spirituality, and love. While other nations may rise to the forefront of history and exhaust their powers, the Jewish nation, whose fealty to Mosaic law grants them a closeness with the source of spirit itself, is immune to the fluctuations of history so long as they hold fast to this divine mission. To this end, claimed Hirsch, the Israelites were granted the Holy Land in order to build a model spiritual ethical society. However, as time wore on, the Israelites rebelled against this mission and were deservingly scattered to the four corners of the earth. Ignoring, or perhaps rejecting, the major polemical thrust of rabbinic tradition, Hirsch viewed these subsequent exilic wanderings in a positive light. Being deprived of their national homeland liberated the Jews from the tainted endeavors so central to political and national subsistence, such as court intrigue, warfare, and bureaucratic governance, allowing them to focus all their energies upon their global religious mission. Moreover, the exilic wanderings enabled Jewish communities to attain cultural and geographical proximity to all the world centers of civilization, enabling them to foster a heightened awareness of God's presence in every society. Hirsch's rather romanticized and typological reading of Jewish history proclaims their condition of landlessness and peregrination as key factors that allowed the Jews to fulfill their unique religious mission, and therefore Hirsch denounced the first flowerings of Jewish nationalism or Zionism within his own lifetime. The second exemplar of this intellectual strain is the philosopher Franz Rosenzweig, 1886 to 1929, whose opposition opposition to nationalism stemmed from his philosophical convictions, which envisions two separate planes of existence within which nations reside. The historical plane of existence is scientific, objective, and deterministic, with its pro progressions occurring in a linear, diachronic fashion. Such a plane of experience allows for a vibrant, earthbound national life, but one that is subject to the laws of atrophy and decline.
It is on this plane, in Rosenzweig's view, that the Christian nations of the world abide. By contrast, the Jews reside in the redemptive plane of existence, which entirely askews the boundaries imposed by time, geography, language, or any natural facet of national development. This redemptive plane constitutes an eternal yet sight, a now moment, a state of living that transcends the contingencies of timeliness. The Jews, through their intense theophany at Sinai, were lifted out of the stream of regular time and placed in direct confrontation with the source of eternity, permanently dislocating them from the rhythms and processes of national development. This eternity came at a considerable cost. The Jews, tragically, can find no repose either temporally or geographically. They can only wander aimlessly throughout the world, inhabiting an ontologically distinct, self-contained, unchanging stratum of being. As the eternally displaced nation, the Jews cannot be tied down to any of the temporal or corporeal trappings of nationhood. Galutiyut, a state of physical and existential exile, is for Rosenzweig central to the Jewish condition. The homeland, the biblical homeland promised in the Bible, imprisoned the eternal Jewish spirit. The dispersion of the Jews, far from being a divine punishment or historical accident, was a necessary liberation entirely commensurate with their meta-historical existence. Judaism was thus equated with a destabilized, unheimlich form of nationhood, which necessarily repudiates all connections to fixed points of identity, namely territory, language, historical development, and political homogeneity. This mode of being for Rosenzweig underwrites the mystery of Jewish eternity and hence Rosenzweig's lifelong diffidence, even antagonism towards the Zionist project. The final important thinker within this coterie that I would like to mention is the late George Steiner, 1929 to 2020, a famed academic literary critic and essayist. While not a native German, Steiner nonetheless spoke German from birth wrote and lectured extensively in German and centralized the work of key Germanic thinkers, such as Hegel, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. Steiner was the most important and most explicit post-1948 champion of Galutiot, the notion that Jews ought to prioritize, embrace, and cherish their exilic existence. Basing his ideas upon Hegel's analysis of the Jewish condition, Steiner posited that Jews necessarily exist as strangers in this world, deprived of all natural ties of race, nation, and territory. The Jew, for Steiner, has no earthly home. Spurning all materiality, the Jew retreats from the cruel physical world into an abstract, self-created bunker of, de of devotional seclusion, namely the cocoon of sacred texts. For Steiner, the Jew's true homeland is the canon of texts, every commentary a return. This unique disposition transformed the Jews into a cosmopolitan, migratory, translinguistic, and transcultural nation whose very essence rejects the fatuous loyalties of flag, anthem, nation, territory, and race. Crucially, Steiner forms, views this form of meta-territorial existence as ethically superior. Due to their powerlessness and dispersion, the Jews constitute the perennial other, the victim of violence and abuse. As such, they have been spared the necessary horrors of defending and maintaining a political state, horrors including militarism, dictatorship, oppression of dissent, and grubby political intrigue. The Jews' existential disposition is that of Geworfenheit, thronness, a Heideggerian term that Steiner employed frequently. The Jews are always guests in another's home, and their historic mission involves demonstrating the superiority of scholarship, openness, and truth above the common divisive loyalties of king and country. This historic destiny be bestows a moral exceptionalism upon the Jews. Zionism, therefore, in Steiner's eyes, constitutes an unforgivable betrayal of this historic purity through the reintroduction of political expediency, discrimination, racial superiority, and territoriality back into the annals of Jewish history. To replace texts and teachers with ministers and missiles represents a return to barbarism and ordinariness antithetical to this idealized spirit of the Jewish nation. In sum, this tradition of exceptionalist anti-Zionism may be said to have multiple dimensions and many different, even conflicting, sources of provenance. For Hirsch, the Jews' elevated, God-given mission as spiritual ambassadors takes priority over all territorial aspirations. For Rosenzweig, it was the Jews' ontological estrangement from the stream of history that 
that necess necessitates a meta-territorial existence. And for Steiner, it was the ethical superiority of the perpetual scholarship and victimhood that repudiates the ethos of the nation state. Despite their differing ideologies, all three thinkers perceived of Jews as exceptional in some way or other, and it is this exceptionalism that rejects all nationalist territorial aspirations. The existence of this exceptionalist anti-Zionist strain is certainly curious. Perhaps more curious is the fact that all these thinkers mentioned above stemmed from a specifically Germanic cultural and intellectual milieu. While why this might be the case, the precise extent and nature of the links between German Judaism and exceptionalist anti-nationalism ought to be the subject of further study by scholars. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for your paper, uh, JJ, uh, and thank you for um, um, three excellent papers, which I think um, will stimulate um, a um, an incisive discussion. Um, I have a question for Vera. Um, how were you able to quantify the share of Jewish and non-Jewish maids working for Jewish, non-Jewish families? What kind of sources did you use? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for this interesting question. I uh, work with uh, court records, criminal records, so I only have you know, a specific group of uh, Jewish mates uh, that I can talk about because, you know, uh, the uh, there were more uh, Jewish mates who were only declared, only labeled as such by uh, the Jewish community and were in fact uh, family members, uh, close relatives who could only get, you know, the, the right to to stay in Frankfurt under the label of uh, a, a Jewish maid. Um, I, you know, you, you cannot quantify uh, the very existence of the, these maids. You, we only know uh, from the sources that in principle, uh, Jewish families at the time were not allowed to have uh, Christian maids except for the Shabbos maids. And in principle, only uh, one uh, Jewish maid uh, was allowed in, uh, yeah, to serve in, in, in a Jewish family. Thank you, Vera. I, there's, a quest, I, there's a question here for Professor for Tobias Brinkmann. You use the term repairing the world or tikkun. The questioner is interested in how this conception of the world uh, differs from ideas circulating in Christian Europe at the time. How does Morgenthau's conception diverge from the discourses of rights and barbarity used to fuel European intervention in the Ottoman territories? What's particularly Jewish uh, about Morgenthau's conception? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I um, So I'm fairly new to this project, um, um, and I know there's somebody else is uh, completing a study about the Morgenthau family that should be uh, published in the next year or two. Uh, my gut feeling is that that study is going to be a more, much more focusing on the family history and the embarrassments and the scandals. Uh, what I maybe it's not, uh, uh, but what I find uh, interesting about this story is Henry Senior. He's I think the key figure. He connects the German part of the story with the American part. He lived a very long life. He was active as a commentator. And so what I find particularly interesting uh, is that I don't think that there was a system in place in uh, in 1914, 15, 16. So he kind of stumbled into it. There is a history of, of Jewish ambassadors uh, representing the United States uh, in uh, Istanbul. Um, and I mentioned he was not a Zionist, uh, but clearly uh, the, the Yishuv was in great danger because uh, the Ottoman authorities considered most Jews as enemy aliens because they hailed from the Russian Empire. And uh, likewise, the Armenian uh, genocide, and I have actually not mentioned that in my uh, presentation, Morgenthau blamed Germany for it. 
Uh, so he pretty much uh, argued in a book that he wrote in 1920, which is his memoir, which is sort of an interesting connection to his father's memoir. Uh, he argued uh, that Germany was complicit in it. That, uh, and I think this is pretty much uh, the core with the research today. Um, and so this is where uh, I think uh, there's been a lot of literature about human rights and intervention that uh, I think we better take a closer look at, at world, the First World War um, and uh, the question of intervention. And Morgenthau is somebody who, as I said, stumbled into it and tried to make sense of it. Of course, he failed, right? Uh, his son also failed. Uh, Germany did not become an agricultural backward country, obviously. Um, uh, but I think it, uh, we should think about uh, their roles in, this, in these terms. Uh, thank you, Tobias. Um, I have another question here. Um, would any of the three of you uh, like to comment on the German influence on the Jews highlighted in the presentations? For example, Tobias talks about the Jewish influence of repairing the world. How was it that this came out specifically out of Germany? Uh, the same for JJ's discussion of the three individuals and their views of Jewish exceptionalism. How is this influenced by German life uh, or thought? Um, Tobias or JJ, who would like to go first? Uh, Tobias, since you're on the screen, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I make it very quick. Uh, I think I already mentioned this, um, and I think Viera should also respond to that. I think it's an interesting question. Uh, thanks, Billy. Um, I think it is the the notion what we talked, what Viera actually hinted at a little bit, or the period, the late 18th century. It's this vision of uh, the Enlightenment, of uh, considering Jews as actually human beings uh, with a legal status. Uh, that is really uh, path breaking, and David has worked on this also. Uh, so I think that there's there's an utter disappointment that Germany, which was that country representing these inclusive values, was basically uh, 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 you know becoming run by by uh, nationalists uh, you know uh, uh, who basically uh, ditched these goals uh, and destroyed this this country and destroyed uh, these Enlightenment values. And I think that is exactly. Uh, the link here, and the United States, of course, embodied these values in the Constitution, right? This is very important for Reform Jews. I've worked on this. Um, uh, they, and, and that was also under threat in the United States, actually, and is under threat as we speak, obviously. Uh, you know, we still don't have a new president in office. Uh, so this is a really serious issue. And this is where Germany comes into the picture. It's this vision of this universal, inclusive, enlightenment Germany, a German culture that uh, informs these opinions. Um, I, I'd just like to, to, to mention uh, one example of this, of the role the, that the U.S. played. Uh, I've just read uh, Michael Myers' uh, new magisterial biography of, Leo, of Rabbi Leo Beck, uh, and he points out clearly uh, that uh, during the Third Reich uh, and the uh, mass murder of Jews and Beck's time in Theresienstadt, that Beck held on to the example of the United States uh, as an exemplary and as an exemplar of democracy and humanity for the world. So th this clearly plays a role. Uh, JJ, would you like to comment now, please, on, on the question about what is specifically German Jewish? Um, yes, the answer for, for my presentation is a little difficult to give, um, precisely because the three figures that I mentioned are all extremely different in every other respect, aside from the respect that I mentioned. In other words, all three of them are very disparate on the religious and ideological spectrum, and therefore um, a, a, this question is almost biographical to a certain extent. Why these three specific um, thinkers why did they say what they said within their German context? Um, it's a difficult answer to give one for all three because they're so different. I would say that when it came to uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, a large portion of his time uh, really as a rabbi and as a communal leader was dedicated to the question of um, integrating into Germany and that his community in Frankfurt am Main was an aspirational 
um, rising middle class German community to a large degree, and the questions of how to integrate that with a, a kind of with, with traditional Jewish orthodoxy was one of the central questions of his whole career, um, and therefore. So, and a fealty and, and um, sensitivity towards Germany and, and German cultural uh, aspects definitely was central in his in his life. Um, I would say that for Franz Rosenzweig as well, he's, he had a complicated um, relationship with Germany. He fought uh, as, a, as a soldier in World War I, um, but also on the whole, he was generally very, um, very proud and very uh, strongly identified as German and with Germanness, and that's the same very strongly with both uh, Hirsch and Rosenzweig, and therefore their strong fealty towards Germany. However, this kind of conflict that that is engendered by their um, by their Orthodox Jewish proclivities, or in Rosenzweig's case, you know, somewhat uh, only later in life, um, I, I think that is a tension that fueled their uh, their ideas. I would also say that with George Steiner, it's a little different because he himself exemplified through his own biography his own writings. In other words, he was a constantly wandering intellectual. He lived in Cambridge but had a simultaneous chair in both Cambridge and the University of Geneva and had numerous uh, visiting chairs all over the world and spent years and years just traveling the entire world. Also, as a professor in Geneva, he gave a, a graduate seminar in literature in which Every year, you, he gave the seminar in the language of the text under discussion. So if you're studying Shakespeare, he would teach it in English. If you were studying Goethe, he would speak, uh, to teach it in German, etc. So he himself embodied very strongly from his birth, actually, this wandering, transcultural, uh, multilinguistic um, um, Jewish existence. So it's a very specific biographical question on each one uh, that would demand much more space to, to dig than, than I have to go in here. But it's, it's worthwhile researching this. Uh, thank you, JJ. I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, how do the exceptional anti-Zionists deal with the question of uh, taking up arms uh, for the countries, the country in which they lived? Uh, Rosenzweig uh, served as a soldier during the First World War. Uh, Hirsch had to deal with that question uh, for his congregants. Um, um, so. so how do how do they how do they deal with that issue? Um, on the contrary, I think that all I think certainly uh, Rosenzweig and Hirsch would say that part of your duty as a good citizen would be defending your own country, taking up arms in its defence when necessary. Um, but they all saw that as as something of a compromise, something that is less than the highest spiritual good. It's, it's a necessary evil, and therefore they're willing to do it in their capacity as good citizens. Um, what is, uh, However, those two thinkers, of course, were pre-Holocaust, and that makes a huge difference. Steiner, for all his writings, he, he writes these huge essays, you know, defending uh, Jews as an exilic community and as a transcultural migratory community, and then he puts almost as a footnote saying, however, in light of what happened in the Holocaust, you know, one must rethink the the necessity for having somewhere or some capability for the Jews to defend themselves. And therefore, I think all three of them viewed it as a necessary evil, uh, whereas, uh, but, but of course, Hirsch and Rosenzweig, who were, I would say, very much aspiring model German citizens, would say that taking up arms in defense of your native country is very good uh, or a necessary evil, but is not the job of the Jews. The Jews have a higher purpose in the world, and that's why... Jews ought to disdain or, or um, rise above the petty concerns of nationalism. Great. Uh, uh, Vera uh, has a question for Tobias. Vera, please go ahead. Yeah, um, my question goes in a, a little bit different direction uh, due to the fact that I'm always interested in gender. Uh, are you interested in the women of that family as well? And what did you learn about uh, Jewish masculinities from the story of father and sons? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm on the air now. Uh, so this is not my actual research project at this time. Uh, so I sort of stumbled into it. Um, women are all over the story. Obviously, uh, Lazarus deserted his wife. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, this is uh, pretty uh, pretty serious. There were uh, sisters. Um, um, I have not really looked too much into this because there, I found out that there's another person writing a book about it, so I'll see whatever is in that book. Uh, but they are very much part of this story. Uh, 
but my my very lame excuse is in a sense that uh, I have, you know, in a sense I read the diary and I try to figure it out. Um, the diary, by the way, uh, there's a lot about the mother in there and the sisters and about these older siblings uh, taking care of the younger children. Uh, so this is also about children, actually, which is another category that's often missing uh, in the story. Um, I just want to briefly interact. There's another question about the Lehman Brothers. Um, uh, that uh, so I'm uh, in, in this is why I have a little bit of a problem with the, the title of the panel from refugees to citizens. Uh, I, I'm very much writing against this sort of lacrimose view of modern Jewish history. Uh, most of these uh, migrants, uh, Jews who left the German states before 1880, and also Eastern European Jews, by the way, who left uh, before 1914, were not fleeing persecution. They were uh, looking for better opportunities. So it's very much an economic story. Uh, and, uh, and that doesn't mean that the pogroms didn't take place or that there was no anti-Semitism or restrictions. Uh, that is all true. But it didn't necessarily have a lot to do with the decision to migrate. Um, so that's that's really important. And again, this is not just men migrating, but also women and often children, which is interesting. <coughs> Thank you, Tobias. Uh, I, I have a question for Vera. Um, there's been um, quite a bit of recent scholarship which takes issue with the notion uh, that Jews had a separate court system in early modern Europe uh, that continues certainly to the end of the 18th century, in some cases into the early 19th century, which prevented Jews from using uh, the secular courts or Christian courts. Uh, there's Berkowitz's scholarship on Alsace, showing the interrelationship of the courts in the 17th and 18th century. There's Margolin's um, scholarship on Jews in Morocco doing forum shopping and using a number of different kinds of courts, Jewish, Muslim, and state courts. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say something about the historiographical implications uh, of, of your own research on the, on the example of Frankfurt. Uh, thank you very much. I, I would say uh, my findings uh, confirm in the first place uh, the f uh, findings of uh, Gottsman, who uh, did an, an enormous, uh, enormous research on the rabbinical, rabbinical <laughs> legislation in, in the city of Frankfurt and Mine, and, Mine, and who uh, came to the conclusion that the legislation of the Christian court and the legislation of uh, the Jewish courts cannot be separated at all. And I, I would confirm this from, from uh, uh, my research. You know, the, 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 Christian, uh, the Christian courts almost handled every court that came to them. Um, even, 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 even cases that, that should have been handled by rabbinic law. They, they, they treated everything, in, in fact. C case said there were uh, conf uh, concerned conflicts uh, concerning uh, Jews within uh, the Jewish lane, uh, cases that concerned even religious affairs. It depended if the, the Christian courts could uh, get something out of it, <laughs> usually money. Uh, they, they, they used it, also they used it uh, uh, in order to, to get insights of the, uh, the the affairs of the the Jewish uh, community. So, but you know, my, my study is really a micro study, really focused on on, on the city of Frankfurt and and, and the specific uh, history of of this uh, center of, of Jewish life. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank our three panelists for uh, their excellent papers, uh, our audience for uh, penetrating and insightful questions. Uh, I'd like to wish all of you um, uh, a, uh, a very delightful time at the rest of the conference. Thank you uh, and goodbye.